Hey, well, welcome to Eternal Rock Church. My name is Joe Alvarado. Hey, you guys, um, I love you and I miss you and I'm here via video today and I'm so glad to be with you. Those of you who are online, you wouldn't know the difference because I'm on video anyway. No, just kidding. No, this is <laughs> me and hey, we're in part four of In This Together. I hope you've had a, an amazing time learning and going through kind of the big picture, the, the bird's eye view of the book of Philippians. There's four chapters. We've been taking a chapter each week. This is the fourth chapter, uh, perhaps one of the most in, important chapters of this whole book. And what we've been doing again is just flying over the top and then going down and looking at some of the verses up close and then flying up kind of like your GPS, right? So when you um, put your coordinates, your, your address into a GPS to go to work or to go to the store or to go to a friend's house, wherever, um, it shows you the bird's eye view. All right, it's going to take you from here to here and it's going to take 30 minutes. And then all of a sudden, it goes to street view and you know it's coming up. And that's kind of what we're doing. We'll go to bird's eye view. Here's the book. And we've been talking about how it's Paul, the author of Philippians, how he wrote 13 books of the New Testament out of the 27, pretty important guy. And it was written about AD 61. It was known as the epistle of joy, right? The book of joy, because he mentions joy 16 times, even though, as we've been saying, uh, he is writing this from prison. And so he's, he's in prison. He was falsely accused. He's not where he should be, where he deserves to be. And he still talks about joy. And again, we talked about how this is the Christian life, uh, Christ on our mind, Christ as our goal, Christ as our strength and joy through suffering. Chapter one, the marvel of the Christian, the model of the Christian chapter two, the march of the Christian. And today we're going to talk about the marks of a Christian. That's the big bird's eye view. Now we're going to go diving down into the street view and take a look at some of these scriptures. Now, before we get there, I want to remind you of kind of our journey together and where we've been. The first week we talked about how grace always comes before peace. You don't experience peace in your life unless you understand the grace of God. And that's just the way it works. If you're online watching, can you give me just an amen right there? Just type amen for me, right? The church is a family that partners together to spread the good news about Jesus. Um, believers should look at the results of a difficult situation, not the situation itself. These are these big cliff notes that we learned. Believers should unite love and work together. We should do everything in humility without complaining so that we will shine in a dark world. We also learned that thriving in your faith protects your faith. And probably the biggest thing that we learned last week that is that we're saved by faith alone. It's through faith, right? And we should forget the past and look ahead. We should learn from others and remember that we're citizens of heaven. That's kind of where we've been. And we said this, that we got this scripture, this whole title rather of this series in this together from Philippians chapter one, verses 30, where Paul says, we are in this struggle together. And I remind you, church family, I remind you those who are visiting online, those who are new to Christianity, or even if you're just curious about Christianity, that in God's kingdom, we're in it together. Are we going to be perfect at it? No. Are we going to argue sometimes? Yes, we're going to find that out today. Are we going to um, not get along at times? Yes, but do we have one goal, one purpose, one mind, and one direction that we're all headed? Yes, and that's what Paul wanted the church to know. He loved the church so much. He called them his own. He used a lot of I and my and we in this uh, particular book because he took it personal, you know, and I've told you this every week. I love the classes that I teach at the gym and I always say, oh, it's my class. I love my class. Or when I have to miss a week, it's like, oh man, I'll miss you guys, you know, or church. I love my church, right? And, and when I'm not there, like now and I'm via video, I'm like, I miss you guys. And so it's, 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 I miss my church, my people, not in a way that we said last year where my communion cup or last week where my communion cup went flying. I think that video went viral. Um, but in a way that says, man, I, I, just, I just really love my church. I really love my classes. I really love my family and I miss them. And this is the type of connection that Paul had with this church. So let's get to verse one, Philippians chapter four, verse one, scripture says this, Paul says this, there, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you and long to see you, dear friends. For you are my joy and the crown I receive for 
my work. That's, that's such an amazing way to say it. Um, he says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, you know, I grew up in a church where we called each other brother and sister, brother D, right? You heard him a lot this series. Uh, uh, brother Joe, how you doing? Or hermano, hermana, right? And it got to the point where uh, we would just say brother and we wouldn't say our names after it. And it would be to the point where we would say, hey, uh, so-and-so needs help. That, that one brother, like, yeah, brother, the brother, brother, the brother, sister, brother. Like, <laughs> we didn't even know each other's names because we would just know each other as brother and sister. And it wasn't personal at all. But anyway, um, <laughs> I grew up that and I never knew their name. Paul uses it a little bit different, I feel. And he uses it to remind them. Listen to me. This, there's a distinct difference other than making the excuse that I don't know your name, so I'm going to call you brother. He uses it in a way to remind them that we're a family. We're a spiritual family. He's saying brothers and sisters, you know, and, and obviously they're not blood biological brothers and sisters. Maybe some of them were, but probably the majority of them weren't. In fact, some of them were Jews and some of them were Gentiles. And he's saying to these all mix of people, kind of like look, look around the church. There's a mix of us. We're brothers and sisters. He, he referred to them in the sense that we're like family, right? He uses specific names right after this, right? And, and he says this, he says, there, the description that Paul says here, and again, he says, my dear brothers and sisters, I love you and long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I receive from my work. Their description, right, as Paul's joy and crown, he's calling them his joy and crown. It, it echoes uh, his words uh, in 1 Thessalonians 2.19, and, and, and scripture says this, he said this earlier to another church, after all, what gives us hope and joy? What will be our proud reward as a crown as we stand before the Lord Jesus when he returns? It's you. It's you. What, what's going to give us that joy? What's the crown? It's you, right? He's saying it's you guys. The Philippians were his present joy as he received amazing reports, right, of what they were doing, their spiritual growth and their presence with Christ. Um, and, and I just can't imagine that and, and imagine this um, as we work together, as we're in this together, as we're one church, one body, brothers and sisters, and we help other people find Jesus. Can you imagine when Christ comes back, right? And we go to heaven or we die, we go to heaven before he comes back and we see people there that we had a hand together helping meet Jesus. And now they're in heaven for eternity. I mean, if that's not a reward, if that's not a crown, I, I don't know what is, right? And this is what Paul is saying. I do this because you're my reward. You're, you're my joy. You know, there's nothing in life, and I say this a lot to you. I say this a lot to my classes. I get no better joy than helping people. I love to help people. I love to teach people. I love to encourage people. I love to motivate people. It brings me joy. And when we do it together, we're stronger. We reach more people. And Paul is reminding us, that, hey, you're my joy. You're my crown, right? When I stand before Jesus, who uh, better than to call, this is my reward than, than you, than the people that we've helped reach together. The Philippians were his present joy. And Paul reminds them, again, that they're family. And he's setting them up. Listen to this. He's setting them up, calling them brothers and sisters, saying that we're in this together, saying that uh, you're my crown, you're my joy, because, check this out, in verse 2, he says, now I appeal to you, Yodia and Sintik, and, and I may be butchering those words, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreements. Are there disagreements in church? Yes, all right. The Bible is real. I keep telling you, the Bible is very real. It's, it, it's realistic, right? Um, settle your disagreements. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these women, for they work hard. For they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my coworkers whose names are written in the book of life. So, Paul, he gets personal here. He starts mentioning names. And aren't you glad? that you're not just another person, you're not just another number, you're not just another bald head, right? Pastor Bethel, right? You are a person to God. You have a name. You're special to God. And, and when Paul 
uh, wrote this, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's writing to the church, in turn writing to us, and we receive this message and mentioning names who will forever be written down in history because these people were important to God, to us, and we learn this way. God's important in his value of individuals. He mentions this name, their names, because God is personal. And here's, here's what he does, and this is amazing. Paul's an amazing writer. He reminds them of who they belong to. You're the Lord's. He reminds them. Then he tells them what to do. Settle disagreements, right? He's saying that in this verse. And then he asks them as partners. So see how he's phrasing this all together? It's genius. He's saying, you belong to the Lord. Since you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreements. You're my partners, right? I'm asking you as a partner. And then he reminds them again. He does this whole thing. Reminds, tells, asks. Reminds them of the investment that they made. Hey, we work together, right? We have history together. We've done this together. Like, let's not waste that time we've, we've put into this, the investment, the nature of the work. It's because it's for God that we work. And then he tells them everyone's names are written in the book of life. He's like, and, the, and there's the result of the work that we did. He tells them, he reminds them we worked. There's an investment. He tells them what the investment, what, what is the result of the investment. People's names are written in the book of life. They're going to heaven. And then he asks them not to be worried. <laughs> so reminds, tells, and asks. Maybe that's what we need to learn today. That's what we need to be reminded of, that God reminds us that we're his. He tells us that we have a job, and he asks us to partner with him. It's, it's an amazing, an amazing thing. And then he asks them again not to be worried. So let's read. Let's continue on. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Don't worry about anything. That's hard to do. We'll talk about it. Instead, pray about everything. You've probably heard this verse a ton of times. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we could understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now he's asking them and he's telling them not to worry about anything. And if anybody has a reason to worry, it's Paul. Why? Because he was in prison, right? <laughs> because he had every reason to worry. He had every reason to be mad. But he told them, don't worry about anything. And instead, pray about everything. What is worry? The Greek word translated is anxious. Uh, to be careful, ah, right? It means to be pulled in different directions. Um, I love what Warren Wearsby said. He said this, our hopes pull us in one direction. I hope this doesn't happen. I hope that doesn't happen. Our fears pull us in the opposite direction. I'm so afraid of this. I'm so afraid of that. And we are pulled apart. Let me read that again. Our hopes pull us in one direction and our fears pull us in the opposite direction. We, and we are pulled apart. <laughs> wow. So he says, don't worry. Don't worry. And it's so practical. He said, instead of worry, pray. And we've said this so many times. There's just something about a prayer. There's just something about when we say, look, let's stop. Everybody, let's stop. You know, something's going on. Let's pray. Somebody's sick. Somebody just got in a, in a car accident. There's a relationship that's being broken. There, there, there's kids that you're struggling with homeschool in this season, right? Somebody got COVID. Somebody is just you got news that they got put on a ventilator. I don't, I don't know what it is. But you stop, you pray, and there's just something that happens whether you believe in God or not. I've had people ask for prayer that have never walked into a church, that never have never read the Bible, that don't know anything about God. And after the prayer, they're like, thank you. Like they, they, God gave them peace, and they don't even know God because there's something that's true about God. And God says, when you pray, you'll experience peace that exceeds anything we could understand. We don't get it. And so I like this. A peace-filled life is only accessible through a prayerful heart. Peace-filled life is only accessible through a prayerful heart. Or we could say this, even more practical. We could say telling God plus thanking God equals peace that guards our hearts and our minds. 
Can we say that again? Telling God, telling him what we need, telling him what's going on, plus thanking God, plus thanking him for who he is and thanking him for allowing us to talk to him equals peace that guards our hearts and our minds. We have this peace that he gives us and immediately we start to think that things are going to be okay. Now, Paul continues and he helps us understand this idea of how we think and how we should think. And he says this in verse eight, and now dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, listen to this, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Paul, he gives these lists of you, we could say Christian virtues, right? Um, On how we should think, what we should think about. And so he gives these these lists, and I want to go through them real quickly, one at a time. True, he says, think about what is true. These are things that are valid. True could be something that's reliable, something that's honest. It's the opposite of false. In fact, true or the truth characterizes one of God's characteristics. Uh, For example, in Romans 3, 4, scripture says, even if everyone else is a liar, God is true. God is true. There's nothing false about God. Everything God says is the exact truth. And it's never, never, never will return void. He says honorable. Think about what's honorable. Honorable, think about that. Things, the quality that makes people worth worthy of respect. Man, we we need to honor that man for his time that he spent in the military. We need to honor him for what he did for that family. We need to honor that firefighter. We need to honor that teacher. We need to honor that police officer. We need to honor mom and dad. We need to honor uncle and aunt, grandma and grandpa, whoever it was for the life they lived, for what they did, what they contributed, all of the above. Honor. Think about that. Right, he says. Right refers to what is upright or what is just, pure. It emphasizes moral purity, things that are pure, lovely. It relates to what is pleasing and agreeable and admirable denotes what people admire about something or someone, right? And then he goes on to things that are even bigger, right? He says, excellent and praiseworthy. Think about all these things. Think about them. So the question is, like, how how can we control the thoughts that come uninvited into our minds. Because again, the Bible's realistic. Again, if we're honest, right? If you've lived a day of life, you know that thoughts, negative thoughts, fear, um, the worst, often comes into our minds. It's like the first thing we think of. Oh, they're just out to get me. Oh, he's going to hurt me. Oh, like I... (laughs) I, this, I'm going to lose my job. Oh, I, I hope, you know, my, I could pay the rent next week. What, whatever it is, negative comes into our minds almost by default. And we kind of understand why that is because we were born into sin. We were handed sin, our sinful nature. That's why Christ came. We preach it every week to renew our thoughts, to renew our minds. And Paul is showing us how to do it. But how do we do that? How do we control? Paul's He's not talking about, um, he, he, was not, he was talking about these things that invade our thinking, right? Um, temptation, discouragement, again, they could come on announced. But he's saying when he says fix your thoughts, <laughs> he's saying that there's a discipline involved in that, right? Um, in making a conscious choice to think of these types of things. And when we do, when we decide, wait, my mind just went to a really dark place. I'm going to choose to go to a bright place. My mind just went to a place where I really don't want to think about, where it's probably not fair for the person I'm thinking that about, and I need to think differently. I need to change my thoughts. I remember a long time ago, I was trying to help a friend who was having audio problems with his, his system. And uh, it, it, uh, most of it, I, we concluded that it was a, just a bad microphone. And so I was talking to a mutual friend of ours. We were kind of discussing the situation he was having at his location. 
And I said, look, I've got an extra setup here. I've got an extra mic. This is going to sound phenomenal. People are going to love it. I sent my friend with this microphone to take it over to our mutual friend, our other friend, and he delivered it. And, and, and that friend got upset, got offended. Like, can't believe Joe would think what he has is better. Or why would he even send that? Like, as if I didn't know what I was doing. He got back to me that that was his reaction. Now, my first thought was, really? Like, that's my personal stuff that I'm loaning that could potentially get damaged? And that jerk, right? Like, that was honestly the first thought, but I had to, had to stop. And I had to tell my friend who relayed this message, maybe he shouldn't have relayed the message. I had to, I had to tell him, you know what? We just got to love people. That, that was my, my message. Like, it, it could have been, hey, maybe he was having a bad day, maybe... But my default message was, and maybe I got this from my dad, we just have to love people. And, and my friend's like, yeah, you're right. You're right. Because he was upset saying, guess what happened? You tried to help and he was getting all upset. And, and, and we could have easily went down a negative path and said, how dare him? And that's messed up. And we're not going to be his friend. And we're not going to ever want to help again. But instead, changed the conversation. I said, listen, we have to love people. And that's what Paul's talking about. It's a discipline. It's a discipline to say, look, these negative thoughts are going to come to my mind, but I have to choose to love people. I have to choose to think the best. I have to choose to think of what's pure and what's right. I have to choose to think that I don't like this situation, this negative thought or this negative situation, but I do choose to, to remember that God is good. God is true. God is excellent, right? God is praiseworthy. And God's going to get me through this. We choose to think differently. And we attack those evil thoughts, we attack that temptation, we attack what's trying to get us down. That's what we do, and that's what we practice. Christians, if you're taking notes, should discipline our minds and make conscious decisions, conscious choices to think good things. It's a discipline. It's a discipline. It's a discipline. It's a discipline. And he, Paul, in verse 9, ends <laughs> by saying and talking about this discipline. Um, he says, keep putting into practice all you've learned and received from me. Everything you've heard from me, you saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Keep putting into practice. Keep putting into practice. You know, oftentimes um, you'll hear me preach similar topics, uh, but just repackage them, right? Uh, maybe it's talking about anger. Maybe it's talking about God's love. Maybe it's talking about a response to fear. Maybe we talk about um, uh, family or giving. And you're like, man, I, I feel like Joe's preached about this, bro. I feel like he's talked about this before. And it's not that I don't have anything else to talk about, but it is a practice that some of the big things in life, some of the big highlights of the Bible need to be repeated over and over again. And sometimes that means us, that means me, that means you and I refocusing, saying, all right, I've been here before. I've, I may have heard this before, but it's important for me to practice. It's important for me. Like we've, we've preached on this before. We did this series, I don't know if you remember this, but we did this series a few years back, and it was called the same thing, in this together. And God put it on my heart to do it again. And each time we do this, I'm a little older, right? Have a little bit less hair. And, <laughs> and, it's, and it comes out a different way, right? Maybe with more uh, wisdom, right? Maybe with a little more experience, maybe from a different perspective. Same message, but it's practice. It's us putting these things into practice. Look at somebody next to you and say, it's all about practice. Type in the notes, practice. We need to practice. We need to put into practice what we believe. Type it in the chat right now. I want to see it. We need to put into practice what we've learned. Because that's what God would have us do. Practice all you've learned. I tell this to my classes all the time. I love cycling. In fact, um, I, there was a memory that came across my Facebook um, this last week, 
And sometimes those memories you don't want to remember, right? Sometimes they're like, you know, that, that's not a place where I wanted to be or a, a person I want to be with. But, but this memory was special because it, it, it basically said this. And if you follow me on Facebook, maybe, maybe you've seen it. It said, don't miss something like this. Don't miss spin class tonight, 4.30 with Angel or 6.30 with me. Be there to burn off those extra holiday calories, right? That was, that was my post. And then I looked at the top. It was a memory. It was from 11 years ago. These were some of the first cycling classes, spin classes that I had ever taught. I'd been training maybe a year before that. So I, I celebrated about 12 years recently of teaching indoor cycling. And I say that because I don't want you to clap for me or anything, although this is a great opportunity to do that. Hello right? No. Um, I say that because I sit on a bike every week and go 10 to 20 miles per class, right? And the bike goes nowhere. It just does this. It just, it just, it just does this. I don't go anywhere. (laughs) My legs don't do anything different. My heart rate goes up. It comes down, right? And, And the thing is though, Practice, practice, practice has gotten me in, in great cardiovascular shape. And it's not that I'm doing anything different, maybe different music, maybe different drills, maybe different, different types of uh, uh, class versions and styles, but it really is a practice to keep the body healthy, to keep my mind strong, to keep my heart beating. And when we practice what God asks us to practice, practice love, practice our thoughts, put them on, on, on what's true, what's right, what's admirable, we get better at it. And you know what? I'm really good at teaching cycling. All right, I just got to say that. I'm, I, 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 I've done it a lot, and I, I love it. I'm good at it. And in fact, I'm not here today because I'm in a training. I'm training other instructors on how to do the same. And practice is what God and what Paul is inspired by the Holy Spirit writing to us to practice, to get better, to rehearse so that when the temptation comes, when, when the, the attacks come of the enemy, when, when somebody says something you don't like, when somebody says something hurtful, when you go through and you face a difficult situation, we're in it together. You're not alone. We think on these positive things and we remind ourselves God is good God is worthy of praise and can we just end by reminding ourselves hey we're in this together and when the trials come when we have disagreements when the temptation plagues us when the hurt is thrown at us when the pain from a loss cuts deep in us, we will think and we will remember, God, you're good. God, you're pure. God, you're holy. God, you're worthy of worship. And God, you're going to see me through. And God, you've established my salvation through the death and the resurrection of your son. And you've established a family that I can call mine, a church family. And in this church family, although we'll not ever be perfect, we're in it together. We're in it together. Practice. There's a definition, and I'll finish with this. Practice is the act of rehearsing a behavior over and rehearsing a behavior and over or engaging in an activity again and again for the purpose of improving or mastering it, as the phrase goes, practice makes perfect. I prefer practice makes excellent because we can never be perfect, right? We can never be perfect, so practice makes excellent. You could be really good at something. You won't be perfect at it. It's impossible. But we practice for the purpose of improvement. I pray for you. God, we come before you and we're so grateful for the book of Philippians. We're so grateful, Father, for you inspiring Paul through your Holy Spirit to write this letter to that church, which in turn 
went and was inspired and was inserted into the word of God that we have your word today that will forever be true, that will forever be righteous, will forever be, Father, a, a, a guiding light until the day that you come back. And as Paul said, Father, we're citizens of heaven. And as we're praying, I want to invite you, if you've never accepted Christ into your heart, you've always known you've been missing something, maybe you've been watching for a while, today's your day to say, I'm going to start a relationship with God. I don't know a whole lot about him, but I know on my own, I can't do it. And I realize that I need to reconnect with my Savior because I'm imperfect. I'm a sinner. It's really simple. Christ came to die. He came to be born of the Virgin Mary, live a perfect life die and come back to life on the third day for the sacrifice of our sins so that we could be made right before a holy God. We can establish a relationship that was intended from the very beginning. You, me, connecting with the God of the universe, the one and only true God. The Bible says that if we confess our sins and invite him to be our savior, he is faithful to forgive us and he will save us. And if that's you, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. And to say, dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I need a savior. I can't do this alone. Forgive me of my sins. Take my heart. It's no longer mine. It's yours. Save me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Eternal Rock Church, can we celebrate a little bit and worship God?